I have finished with gram negative rods and today I'll start with introduction to anaerobes and then I will cover very important Clostridia species which are Clostridium tatinae and Clostridium botulinum. So you should know definition and names of obligate anaerobes, classification of gram positive rods, mode of transmission, pathogenesis, clinical features and laboratory diagnosis of Clostridium tetani and Clostridium botulinum. I am sure you must would have come up with some answer. So obligate anaerobes don't require oxygen to grow. They use an alternative pathway which is the fermentation pathway which breaks down sugars and if you are going to provide them with oxygen they will die and what is the reason for this because these three enzymes are not present in obligate anaerobes these three enzymes neutralize hydrogen peroxide and superoxide radicals which can actually destroy the bacterial cell so these are actually lethal byproducts so if such obligate anaerobes they are exposed to oxygen they don't have these enzymes which can neutralize these lethal byproducts if we have to grow this uh, obligate anaerobic bacteria in a medium so they will grow at the bottom of this tube where there is no oxygen what is the habitat of these anaerobes it can be endogenous for example normal human flora of intestine mouth and genitourinary tract it can also be exogenous from environment for example soil you can see a long list of anaerobes gram positive rods which are spore forming and this includes clostridia species then there are gram positive rods which are non spore forming and this includes actinomyces they are part of normal flora of oral cavity then is lactobacilli normal flora of mouth colon and female genital tract in case of gram negative rods bacteroides fragilis is predominant in human colon Porphyrominus is part of normal flora of oral cavity. Fusobacterium, another anaerobe, which is normal flora of mouth, colon, and female genital tract. There are various predisposing factors for anaerobic conditions. They can be general, they can be specific. In case of general, diabetes mellitus, corticosteroids, neutropenia, immunosuppression and collagen vascular diseases they are included and if you specifically talk about some predisposing factors then there can be any malignancy, um, it can be leukemias, it can be surgery uh, for example of oral GIT female pelvic area it can be oral GIT genital tract disease or trauma it can be human or animal bites it can be even aspiration and also therapy with certain antibiotics so the mechanism is actually decreased redox potential there is obstruction and stasis tissue anoxia or you can say tissue destruction is there and vascular insufficiency so all of these are pre-existing conditions which are favorable for anaerobic infection. Let's talk about classification of gram-positive rods. How to remember this classification? I think the easiest way is to first know which are spore-forming bacteria. So there are two genera, Bacillus and Clostridium. I'll give you an example of Bacillus, Bacillus anthracis, which produces anthrax. And we'll talk about Clostridium species in detail later on. So both of these are spore forming. And there is just one obligate anaerobe in this classification and that is Clostridium. 
So I think rest of the classification becomes easy. You can see non-spore forming bacteria. All of these are aerobic and the examples are Corinium bacterium diphtheri and Listeria. Okay, so we will talk about Clostridium tetanae and Clostridium botulinum simultaneously and we will also see certain differences between these two important gram-positive rods which are obligated. Clostridium tetanae and Clostridium botulinum spores are widespread in soil. The portal of entry is through wound site. Uh, in particular, I would talk about this Clostridium tetanae. For example, if nail penetrates skin, as you can see over here in this image and then is skin popping it's a technique which is used by drug addicts to inject drugs into skin germination of spores is favored by necrotic tissue and poor blood supply in the wound and in case of clostridium tetani this contaminated umbilicus is again a very important mode of transmission. So unhygienic practices such as application of cow dung on the umbilical stump, certain rituals which can involve use of unhygienic uh, instruments such as circumcision or ear boring and even septic abortion. So all of this can result in tetanus because of Clostridium tetani. Talking about Clostridium botulinum. So this is also going to contaminate vegetables, meats and it is also present as a preformed toxin in unsterilized canned foods. So if it is ingested, so it can lead to botulism. We'll talk about this. Um, so Ingestion of honey is another very important mode of transmission. We'll discuss all about this in detail uh, in clinical features of Clostridium botulinum. So there are two modes of transmission in case of Clostridium botulinum. That is through contamination of wound and also through ingestion. I will first discuss pathogenesis of Clostridium tetani. Wound contamination by Clostridium tetanus spores. The next step is germination and multiplication and then release of neurotoxin which is tetanospasmin. This is absorbed by nerve ending and it reaches through retrograde axonal transport to central nervous system where it fixes to ganglioside receptors. And this inhibits the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters such as gamma aminobutyric acid and glycine. Alpha motor neurons are activated and excitatory impulses are spread in the central nervous system. So there is pronounced rigidity, unopposed muscle contraction and spasm. So there is spastic paralysis in case of Clostridium tetani. In case of Clostridium botulinum, botulinum toxin is absorbed from gut and is carried through blood to peripheral nerve synapses where it blocks the release of acetylcholine. So it's a protease that cleaves these proteins involved in acetylcholine release. So there is flaccid paralysis in case of Clostridium botulinum. Clostridium tetani produces tetanus and this is characterized by strong muscle spasm which is actually spastic paralysis. So specific clinical features include lockjaw. And this is because of rigid contraction of jaw muscles which prevents the mouth from opening. And there is a characteristic grimace or this is an ugly twisted expression of face 
which is known as Rhesus sardonicus. Ophisthotonus is a condition in which there is pronounced arching of back due to spasm of the strong extensor muscles of back. There can also be respiratory failure. And do you remember mode of transmission of tetanus neonatorum? So there is complete rigidity in this baby in case of Clostridium tetani. In case of Clostridium botulinum, food borne botulism has the highest risk in case of green beans, peppers, mushrooms and smoked fish. When these foods are canned or vacuum packed without adequate sterilization, spores survive and germinate in the anaerobic environment. Toxin is produced within the canned food and ingested preformed. So there can be diplopia, dysphagia and respiratory failure. Do you know what is this? This is diplopia, double vision. In case of infant botulism, there is ingestion of spores in honey. Organism grows in gut and produces toxin there. So it's mostly in infants less than six months of age. There is constipation, poor feed, weak or altered cry, floppiness or loss of head control. In case of wound botulism, I hope you remember the mode of transmission. So spores can contaminate, germinate and produce toxin at that site. Signs and symptoms are same as in foodborne botulism except GIT symptoms will be absent. So if you remember the skin popping in case of drug addicts, Lab diagnosis of Clostridium tetani day 1. Specimen can be necrotic tissue from depth of wound or exudates from wound. There is a special transport media which is anaerobic transport media in case of obligate anaerobes. And on performing gram staining, there are gram positive rods and the spore formed is terminal. It's spherical and bulging. And this gives an appearance which is known as tennis racket or drumstick appearance in case of Clostridium tetani. So, specimen can be applied on blood agar and Robertson Cook medium. This Robertson Cook medium is a combination of nutrient broth and fat free minced cooked meat particles. You can also use thioglycolate broth for obligate anaerobes and there is anaerobic incubation from 24 to 48 hours. Day 2 on blood agar spreading type of growth is observed alpha followed by beta hemolysis. In case of Robertson cooked medium either sacrolytic or proteolytic effect is observed Sacrolytic means the color of meat pieces turn into red color because of fermentation of glycogen and in case of proteolytic effect there is blackening of meat. So in case of Clostridium tetani there is slight proteolytic effect. So Robertson cook medium is turbid meat is not digested it is slightly blackened okay on performing gram staining again tennis racket shape gram positive rods are observed it is catalase negative oxidase negative motile and go for biochemical tests and sensitivity on day three read the biochemical test results clostridium tetani will give proteolytic effect Whereas Clostridium botulinum has uh, various immunologic types. Type A, B and F will give proteolytic effect. 
whereas type C, D and E will give sacrolytic effect. Interpret the sensitivity results. And for Clostridium botulinum, the organism is usually not cultured. Botulinum toxin is demonstrable in uneaten food and the patient's serum by mouse protection test. Mice are inoculated with a sample of clinical specimen and will die unless protected by antitoxin. Summary Clostridium tetani produces tetanus, whereas Clostridium botulinum produces botulism. Spastic paralysis is a prominent feature of Clostridium tetani, whereas flaccid paralysis is a feature of Clostridium botulinum. There are two important media which are used for obligate anaerobes and that is robertson cook medium or thioglycolate broth this is your assignment thank you